Uh, welcome to the final episode of the Detour's Guide to Travel, Season yeah. 1, Maui. We're back in Tacoma, Washington. We've been here for a little while now. This video is going to be a wrap-up to our time spent on Maui. Um, we're going to try to answer the questions that you guys have asked, uh, posting on our other videos. We're going to wrap up kind of what we did for work, uh, what we did with the car, our living situation, um, all the stuff that maybe kind of is unanswered from our previous videos. We're also at a later time going to do videos about like our favorite restaurants, our favorite beaches, like kind of Maui best of things for people that are just traveling to Maui. So this is our like personal experience wrap up video. So if you've been following along, you know that we did a work exchange on this trip. That's how we stayed in Maui. That's how we provided our housing. Uh, if you haven't paid attention or you didn't watch the earlier episodes, if you go back to episode one, we talk about how we found the work exchange, how we decided on doing the work exchange, all the details of the work exchange, but I just wanted to kind of check back in after the fact and fill in like the gaps on what happened. So uh, basically our first work exchange was up in the jungle, kind of near Kahakaloa. It's on the side of the island where no one goes. It's not the north, it's not the south, it's not the west, it's not the east. It doesn't actually have a name for the area and it's not even Kahakaloa. It's kind of by the Wahe'e Ridge hike, which is also an episode that we did. Uh, we stayed up there for our first three plus months and basically what happened was I traded 40 hours of work for one month of rent. We got our own apartment there that included water, sewer, garbage, recycling, uh, Wi-Fi, everything that we needed was included there. And uh, it was an awesome experience. Um, you can learn more about that property in our property tour on episode four. Um, so if you wanna see the first place we stayed, uh, Maybe I'll link it here, but if not, it's episode four. And then we got another opportunity while we were there to move to Kihei and do another work exchange where we traded 40 hours of work for one month of rent. And uh, that was a full house in Kihei. And the woman who did the work trade with us, Terry, she's actually from Olympia, which is 30 minutes from where we live here in Tacoma. So it's pretty cool that you know, we were able to work with a fellow Pacific Northwesterner and we really enjoyed staying in Kihei. It was the total opposite of where we stayed up in the jungle. It was hot, it was sunny every day, it never really rained, and you know, we were super close to beaches, whereas the other place was up in the jungle and it was wetter and it was 30 minutes to the closest beach and everything was far away. I say that like it's bad, it wasn't bad, but it was just two different experiences. One was kind of more rural and remote, which I'm, I'm into, and then one was more kind of in the heart of it and you know, lots of tourists and, and more busy and, and more hectic, but you know, closer to beaches and amenities and stuff like that. So those are kind of the two work exchanges that we did. I did different projects at each place. I showed the projects uh, in different episodes. So if you're interested in the actual work that I did to trade for rent, uh, I documented <clears throat> all the projects in earlier episodes. So you can go back and watch those. And um, yeah, so the the other question that you might be interested in knowing is like, would it be possible to find work for myself, right? Uh, obviously I traded work for rent, but like, would I actually be able to work on Maui? And my answer is like 100% yes. Um, I had a bunch of different people hit me up just from word of mouth, hearing that I was doing this or that, that wanted to hire me to do different projects. So I think I would have no problem finding uh, carpentry work on Maui and it's pretty well paying considering um, most of the, the wages on Maui are really high, so I don't think I would have any trouble finding work and, and making that a sustainable business if I would have chose to. But obviously our goal was not to permanently stay there, just to take a long-term uh, stay on the island and kind of soak up what life is about. Um, so that's kind of my experience with working on Maui. Laura had a totally different experience. You want to talk about your experience? So before I went, I reached out to multiple studios and didn't get any jobs before we left uh, Washington. And so when we actually moved, I started going around to different studios and taking classes there and trying to introduce myself to the owners. Um, there's an episode, uh, there's actually two episodes. The first one talks about the first few jobs that I got. The second one talks about the jobs that I got in Kihei. Um, 
Overall, it was fairly easy to get hired and it was also really enjoyable. It was a great way to kind of um, meet people, to be a part of the community, to also get yoga classes, right? So that's kind of one of the ways that we um, try to keep our expenses down is if I teach at a yoga studio, then generally you get free yoga at that studio. Otherwise, a yoga membership is like 100 bucks a month, so that's a, like one of my expenses that I don't have to worry about because I get to teach there. So I ended up teaching at three different studios, um, Salasana in Kahului, and then Maui Hot Yoga, and Maui Yoga Loft and Wellness, both in Kihei. I also interviewed at a studio upcountry, I don't remember the name of it, and that we decided that one was way too far away and the pay was not great. So I taught at those three studios and it was absolutely great. I got to take classes, they were amazing teachers. You can learn more about them in the videos that I posted. Um, overall, it's a nice way to kind of just make some income and meet some people while I was on the island. Okay, so uh, that's kind of like our work experience. Obviously the show is geared towards like long-term travelers. So there's a few things you need when you're doing long-term travel that's different than when you're just doing a one or two week vacation, right? On a one or two week vacation, you just rent a car, you get a hotel, you carry, you know, one suitcase or a suitcase and a carry-on. It's very basic, you don't need much. But if you tried to rent a car for six months, it would be extremely expensive. If you tried to get a hotel for six months, it would be extremely expensive. So obviously, you know, you have to do different things when you're traveling long term. So we covered where we worked, we covered our housing. Now Another thing that you need is a vehicle. So, it, like I said, it wouldn't work to rent a vehicle. Um, what we decided on doing was purchasing a vehicle with the intent of selling it again when we left. Um, we ended up test driving a few vehicles. We documented that in an earlier episode. I think it was number three. I'll link it down here or up here or somewhere. I'll link it. I'll link that episode somewhere in here. So we ended up going with uh, a Scion. Uh, we went with the Scion because Toyotas and Scions, uh, they're both made by Toyota. Uh, they're very popular on the island, super easy to resell. Uh, and we figured we should buy something that locals drive instead of buying some stupid car that we would normally drive back here. Uh, so anyways, we went with a little Scion XB. Uh, we paid 4,800 bucks for it and at the end of the trip we ended up selling it for 4800 bucks so we made our money it was pretty straightforward uh, i thought it would be much more difficult to buy a car in a different state but actually in hawaii it was easier to buy a car than it would be in washington state the registration process is totally different than in washington state um, you do a safety check and then you do a registration uh, which in Washington State, you do an emissions check and registration. You only have to do the safety check when you buy the car, and you don't have to do emissions. And the registration, you don't have to do when you buy the car unless the registration is expired. So our registration wasn't expired, so all we had to do was a safety check, which was 50 bucks. You take it into a local auto shop, they glance it over and give you a piece of paper, and then the registration you just go to the Department of Motor Vehicles on Maui and transfer the title. It took like an hour and it was like 20 bucks. The most simple car transferring process I've ever got. And then when it came time to sell it, what I did was I put it up on Facebook Marketplace and I sold it for $4,800 in one day. Uh, super easy. Uh, the guy came over to our house, exchanged money, signed the paperwork, and he was on his way and that was that. So I guess the last details of the car were that um, we we did take it in for an oil change. Um, that was an expense, but like it, it was pretty cheap for the oil change, like 30 bucks or something. And then we put brakes on it. I went over to my friend Derek. Well, I met a guy named Derek, and now I'm friends with them. And I went to Derek's house, and he helped me change the brakes. By help me, I mean he changed the brakes, and I helped him. And. Uh, that was the only expense, so we paid like a hundred something bucks for brake pads and uh, we gave Derek some cash for helping us, but uh, yeah, it was a fun experience. I got to make a friend out of it and um, we 
got new brake pads. So that's that's what went into the vehicle, super easy process. I just wouldn't recommend buying a vehicle that's really cheap because if it's really cheap, it's probably for a reason and that it's not in very good condition. So if you buy a vehicle that's super cheap uh, and it breaks, obviously you're not gonna get your money back out of it. So that's why we decided to go with a little more expensive vehicle. So I was trying to stick right around the $5,000 range because you can get a, a decent car with low miles and good condition and know that you'll be able to get your money back out of it as long as you have it, as long as you look it over and make sure it's a good vehicle, so. So the owner of the second house that we lived at, Terry, she has a, like a Maui Cruiser car and she just leaves it there and drives it when she's on the island. And she also allowed us to drive her car a little bit here and there. So I would kind of take it to work every once in a while when Alex had the Scion and that made life a lot easier. It's kind of difficult to share a car um, a lot of couples, they'll get like a bike or a scooter. Alex ended up getting his scooter. Um, and so kind of, you know, having the ability to do things separate and one person not being trapped while the other person has the car was really nice. So shout out to Terry for letting us drive her car for a little bit. I also forgot to mention that I bought uh, an electric scooter while we were there and used that so that Laura would have a vehicle and I could have a vehicle to get around and uh, I bought that scooter off eBay for 650 bucks. It was a 28 mile range fully electric scooter that goes 19 miles an hour. Uh, I documented that process in an episode earlier too and uh, I had a blast on that thing and I ended up reselling it for more than I bought it for actually. It was like 800 something bucks that I sold it for and the guy was super stoked because it's really hard to get these on Maui, nowhere sells them and uh, that was another alternative. If you're living in like a key, in the Kihei area or Lahaina area and you work in that area, yeah. having a little electric scooter would be an awesome solution and then you don't have to buy a car at all. You could just cruise around like that. Um, it never rains, so it never rains. You're, good. Yeah, you're, you're good. And even if it does, it's like hot so you can still wear board shorts. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is what a lot of you guys are probably interested in who are long-term travelers. You want to know how much it costs and I went through and went onto my bank account and looked at all of our purchases throughout the whole time. We spent very little cash because you don't really need cash on the island and uh, so I had pretty good numbers and I went through and I broke it up into food, transportation, insurance, phone, and then other stuff like shopping, and activities, ferries, stuff like that, parking. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys kind of the rough numbers on how much that how much it costs for us to be there. Obviously these are our numbers. We weren't really eating cheap. We eat almost 100% organic. We shop at Whole Foods most of the time. You could definitely do it cheaper if you shop at Foodland and you don't eat organic. We care about that. We like to eat fresh meats, fruits, and vegetables. That's not exactly cheap on Maui. So uh, yeah, we also ate out a lot, way more than the average people would. <laughs> so this budget, I would say is Unless you eat out every single day, like you're probably pretty good on this budget, uh, especially if you're good about cooking meals at home. I'd say we cooked at home half of the time and ate out half the time. So, um, anyways, I'll go through the numbers now because some of you might not care at all, but some of you do. The first expense was food. I'm counting that as like groceries, restaurants, coffee shop, juice and smoothies, Costco, any of those things. So we ended up spending 50 bucks a day on food. That would be $1,508 a month, and that's $9,048 for the total trip. So that's for the both of us. It's not like split up or anything. That's how much total we spent per day. Um, and obviously, we spent less on certain days and more on certain days. This is averages based on the total amounts, but I broke it down per month and per day. That way you guys would know um, roughly what to budget for. Our next expense would be other is what I'm calling it, but it's like shopping, buying gear, uh, going on ferries, doing activities, uh, all the random stuff that you buy along the way. Uh, that worked out to be 14 bucks a day is what we spent on extra stuff. Uh, that's 433 bucks a month and that's 2,597 total um, for the whole trip. Now I will say we didn't do a lot of tourist guided things at all. Um, one of the only things that we did, Laura went on a whale watch tour. So awesome. Um, I think that was the only thing that we paid for, like... Yeah, we went to Lanai, so we paid for the ferry over there. Camping costs, 
lot since we've been in a good hotel. We did a lot of shopping though. Um, there's not a lot of good places to buy like shorts and swimsuits and stuff like that in Pacific Northwest where we live. So we, we got a lot of cool stuff and gear and uh, you know we, we did pay for like parking and um, all sorts of random little stuff that you need along like a trip this long you know. Uh, the next thing is transportation. I'm counting transportation as like gas, uh, taking the car in for the inspection, doing the brake pads, changing the oil. Um, I put that all together. It doesn't count the cost of the car, but I already told you guys the cost of the car, and that money came back to us, so I'm not going to count that. Uh, we ended up spending $5 a day, that's $151 per month, and that's $906 for the total trip. That's for six months of gas, oil changes, and repairs, $906. Bucks. That's a pretty good deal, I feel like. The next thing was insurance. So we got renter's insurance on both the places that we stay. We need to insure like our cameras and our equipment and the house to make sure anything happens. We ended up doing auto insurance on the car as well. Um, we did get full coverage on the auto insurance just in case something happened to it. We wanted to make sure that we didn't lose the money that we put into the car. So that ended up being about three bucks a day, 88 bucks a month, 528 bucks for the total trip. The last thing is our phones. Um, phones aren't exactly cheap, but we, we we do the iPhone upgrade plan, so we're both paying monthly for our phones. If you buy your phone outright, you're, this will be way less, but we pay for our phone plan through Verizon, and then we pay for the monthly iPhone upgrade plan, so um, it, it, it's kind of expensive. That's why I'm telling you. It ended up being $7 a day, which is $199 a month, and that's $1,194 for the total trip. So. Total per day, we spent $79 on everything a day. We spent $2,379 per month, and we spent $14,273 for six months. So if you don't do a budget and you're not keeping track of the numbers, that might seem like a lot. If you do do a budget, that might not seem like very much. But in our experience, if we look at how much we spend back home versus how much we spend there, it's really not that much different. Um, maybe a few thousand dollars difference, which a few thousand dollars difference to be on Maui total for six months is a hell of a deal. Okay, that's the uh, that's the numbers section for all my numbers people out there. But uh, Laura wanted to talk about some other stuff. I wanted to touch on the benefits of long-term travel as opposed to short-term travel. Most people think that long-term travel is kind of unachievable and um, as long as you can kind of figure out your work situation, uh, financially, long-term travel actually makes a lot of sense. So if you can, um, leave for three months or more and then rent out your house or your apartment while you're gone. There's traveling nurses, there's military people, or even Airbnb um, that you can use your space to bring in income while you're gone. Um, I think that actually saves money as opposed to just going on a two-week trip where no one's going to be at your house and it allows it to just be a little bit more sustainable. Yeah, because if you don't do that, then you're paying for back home and you're paying for over here, which gets super duper expensive. And if you just get that expense covered back home, someone else is paying your rent or mortgage and utilities and stuff like that, then, um, then all you're paying is whatever you're paying on your vacation, which is far less than trying to do two. So that's that's why we recommend doing that. Yeah, we keep our house really minimally decorated and we don't have a lot of personal stuff on the walls and stuff like that. So we just pack up all of our clothes, we put them into bins, put it in storage, we have a shed, and we just lock it up and that way it's rentable. Super easy. So not only do we rent out our house back home to cover that expense, but we have to leave our jobs back home. And my job is pretty easy to leave. Obviously, I run my own business. I do construction and photography. Both of those things, I choose my own schedule. So uh, pretty simple for me to just not do it during the winter if I want to, or really whenever I can pick and choose the jobs that I take and I can create my calendar. And my job is, um, I'm an independent contractor at most of my yoga studios, so I just let them know that I'm leaving for the winter and that I'm going to want to be hired back. And so far it's worked out really well. I've gotten jobs back at almost every place that I've been teaching, um, and that's been sustainable so far. And part of it is that 
we both do good work. She's a great yoga teacher. She works really hard when she's there. She cleans and does stuff that other yoga teachers might not do to, you know, be valuable there. And as well as myself, like, I do really good work, so it's easy for me to get more work when I come home. If you're lazy and you suck and you don't do good work, like, it might be a little harder to pick up and leave. So it's good to have, uh, to treat what you do with respect and do the best that you can and, and just be solid so that when you come and go people can rely on you even if you are gone for periods of time you want to have you know something to come back to based on your your hard work your, your dedication and your passion so. also both of these jobs are specifically cultivated to our style of living so we both at one point had like regular jobs where we worked for other companies and we weren't able to travel. I worked um, in retail, Alex worked up in Seattle, and it came to a point where we knew that we wanted to travel and that that was more important than the security of those, like, working for those bigger companies. And so we chose to quit those jobs and take these jobs that are maybe, like, not as secure so that we could actually travel. So. That, that was intentional. Working for yourself is a must if you want to do long-term travel. Unless you have some magical boss or company that you work for that will let you leave for two, three, four, five, six months. Um, that's not really a thing in America. I know in other places like Australia, jobs do let you take leave of absence and travel, but uh, here in the great US of A, it's just not a thing. So I uh, highly suggest finding something that you can do for yourself and starting your own business. It's pretty simple. So. Yeah. One of the last things that we wanted to talk about was meeting people and making connections on Maui. Um, so I'm pretty extroverted and I like to meet She's people. extremely extroverted. I would almost say 100%. In fact, she took a personality quiz one time and it came <laughs> out as 100% extroverted. So. I think that's not as much anymore, but like if you're behind me in line, I'll probably turn around and try to talk to you. Not probably, um, she will do that. Probably, I'll be listening. Um, so when we got to Maui, I was kind of surprised that um, people weren't, it's not that people were mean, but they weren't like super openly welcoming. Um, and I'm not talking about like people in the tourist like field. Obviously your receptionist is going to be welcoming. Right. Um, so what happened, or what we learned, is that because Maui is such a travel destination, because it's such a tourist place, that the people that actually live there kind of take their time to meet new people, and they kind of hang out and see if you're actually going to stay, and if you're cool, and then they start to make friends with you. So it took us a while to make those connections. Um, once we did, that's actually my favorite part of living somewhere for for more than a short amount of time. We got to meet people who told us what they like to do, who showed us their favorite hikes, their favorite spots, who taught us about the culture and about what to do and what not to do. Um, one of my favorite hikes that we went on was um, our friend Neil took us there and we actually didn't film it because he recommended not filming as it's kind of like a special place on the island and he said he thought it wasn't appropriate for us to film so we didn't. Um, and we actually did a few things where we didn't record at all. Yeah. Um, it's We think that there's a responsibility as people who are sharing this stuff online that uh, we share stuff that it's okay for people to do. And uh, just because of the insane amount of tourism that comes to Maui, I think there's three million people who came last year. It, it's just not possible for everyone to do everything or everything will get destroyed. And so uh, the friends we made on Maui kind of showed us that um, some things they kind of keep to themselves and that the only way you're going to see some of the cool spots is to make friends with people who actually live there and if you're lucky they'll take you um, and so we really appreciated making friends and them sharing special spots with us and just getting to be in the moment not having to document it not having to film it not having to share it on Instagram or post it I guess it's old school at this point to just go out and do that but we had a blast um, I, I made a friend, which is not, uh, I made a few friends actually, and that's not a normal thing for me. I uh, am a little slower to warm up with people, I'm a little less extroverted, and uh, yeah, one of the friends I made, Tim, uh, who actually, Tim is the guy who took us uh, on the kayaking with the humpback whale tour. Uh, he owns a company called Hawaiian Paddle Sports, and they do like ocean activities like 
uh, stand up paddleboard, surfboard, uh, kayaking, traditional canoe, and they do like guided tours. And uh, he took us out, hooked us up with some kayaks, and brought us out. And uh, I became really good friends with him. He, he's an awesome guy, he showed me tons of hospitality, and he even came to Tacoma and visit, visit us. He even came to Tacoma and visited us after we got home. And uh, we got to show him around Tacoma. And, uh, it was cool. So shout out to Tim. Thank you. I appreciate it and appreciate the welcomingness or the aloha as they would say. So that's the end of season one, the Detour Sky to Travel Maui. There's 36 episodes all together. That's because Wu-Tang Clan entered the 36 chambers. So I figured 36 episodes, that's pretty cool. That is very cool. Um, so if this is your first time watching, click the link up here that'll take you to the first episode and you can watch all the way through and join us on our travels. We are going to be doing a second season and we still don't know where we're going to be traveling to. So if you want to give us suggestions, recommendations, if you want us to come visit you, drop a comment below. Let us know where we should go next. Yeah, we, uh, we're tossing around a lot of options, but uh, we're not committed and we usually don't decide to like... A month or two before we're gonna go so um, yeah we're pretty open um, we like the idea of doing work trade work exchange so uh, if you know someone or you are someone and you have something you would like us to do holler at us we uh, are extremely grateful for all the people who took time to watch the show uh, we weren't sure what was gonna come of it but we're pretty stoked on what happened uh, thank you for watching. We are deeply appreciative of all the viewers who have watched and subscribed, given us thumbs up, dropped comments, supported us. Uh, we, we actually have a few supporters on Patreon, which, I don't know, I kind of created that thinking, like, no one's going to support this, like, who cares? But we'll put it up, see what happens. And a few people have started to support us, and that's really awesome. So, um, if you want to support the show, there's a variety of ways to do it. You can just give these videos a thumbs up, you can drop a comment below. Uh, what that does is it tells YouTube to put our video in the algorithm higher than it was before. So the more, more comments and likes that we get, the more it shows to people, and the more our channel grows, which allows us to hopefully, uh, you know, get sponsorships or advertising or, or be able to make a little money off these videos so that we can keep doing them. If you've watched many of these episodes and you've gotten something out of them and you enjoy it or you incorporated some things you talked about to your trip or you're just a fan of living vicariously through us, uh, it would be really cool if you would go to patreon.com slash the detourist guide and uh, contribute to the show. You can do it a dollar a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. We have like hats like this hat right here that I'm wearing. You can get this hat on there by donating and uh, we send you a hat out. So it's pretty sweet. We have shirts and stickers, all sorts of cool stuff. But uh, the thing is that you can sign up to donate on a monthly basis and you can stop doing it anytime you want there's no like contract or anything so if you want to sign up for three months that's fine if you want to sign up forever that's even better <laughs> but uh yeah again thank you very much for watching um, it's rad to have gotten this far and uh thank you for coming along with us on the journey in season one we uh are deeply appreciative thank you bye <laughs>